Yeah. So my presentation is on the U.S. involvement in Taiwan from 1949 to 1979. This, um, this class would occur later in the semester, uh, as we would have covered in Taiwan up to modern day, um, probably from 2000, 2008. And so the reason why I chose the time period from 1949 to 1979 is because um, in 1949, the Republic of China was ousted from China itself and moved towards Taiwan as the People's Republic of China takes control. And then um, in 1979, the Taiwan Relations Act and is passed by Congress, which is signed into law by President Carter, and it effectively ends diplomatic recognition of Taiwan in favor of China. So, And for clarification purposes, I will be referring to the Republic of China as Taiwan and the People's Republic of uh, China as China. Okay, so some background information is that uh, Taiwan was, uh, has been a very colony for, of China for a very long time. It was annexed in 1683 by the Qing Dynasty, and it was turned over to Japan um, during after the first sign of the Japanese War of um, 1894 to 1895. And then when the Qing Dynasty collapsed, there was the Chinese Civil War that lasted for an incredibly long period, almost up to um, 1949 when um, the, the KMT lost. So um, the Civil, Chinese Civil War eventually became a conflict between communist Chinese, Party of China and the KMT, which is the Kuomintang, which um, is basically the nationalist part of China. And so, during this time, there's also the warlord period where there's a lot of infighting. There's like made like um, Jimmy would have described during his presentation. There's a lot of fighting between like major like major groups that like it, bas it was basically complete chaos. And so the KMT emerges with Sun Yat-sen as the president and founder of the Republic of China in 1912. But there's still a lot of infighting. There's like um, so. Uh, China would be unified until much later because of the Second Sino Japanese War, which begins in 1937, which we would know as World War II and on the Asian front. And so it, the infight, like, so basically, the two, um, two groups, they um, actually made a, like, they ceased fighting between each other so they could defeat Japan. And so, and as, as World War II ended, China was returned to China, China and the so Chinese Civil War would resume. And so the early stages of the U.S. involvement, it, it was actually began in 1945 when General George, George Marshall, man right there, uh, was sent to, on a mission to China um, to negotiate a peace treaty between uh, the, the KMT and the Communist Party. It failed majorly. The U.S. Punished, actually punishes the KMT um, for, by cutting off financial aid and military weapons because of, because of Chiang Kai-shek, who will be mentioned later, um, was not willing to negotiate with communists. And so, the, because of the, during this time we all know about the Cold War, and because the, um, the Soviet Union actually began supporting the Communist Party as early as 1923 by sending money and, and, as well as weapons. And so, um, the, but by this point, um, the Joint Chiefs of Staffs for President Truman were actually interested in creating military bases on Taiwan as an effect of, effect of the Cold War itself. But there was, um, uh, when, when, when the KMT was ousted of China, there was a general, UN General Assembly resolution on, in December um, 1949, which basically stated the UN, the UN would not interfere in China's, China's sovereignty, Taiwan's on its own. And so, and this is reiterated in January 1950 when Truman held a press conference, where Truman states that he is uninterested in getting involved in Chinese and Taiwan. Chinese affairs, he, as if he's almost reluctant. And here is a statement from the UN General Resolution. Caitlin, would you mind reading it for me? Sure. The United States government has always stood for good faith in international relations. Traditional United States policy towards China, as exemplified in the Open Door Policy, called for international respect for the territorial integrity of China. To, re to refrain from A, seeking to acquire spheres of influence or to create foreign controlled regimes within the territory of China, and B, seeking to obtain special rights or privileges within the territory of China. Okay, so the first part is actually from Truman's press conferences, press conference, but he actually quotes um, the second line from the UN General Resolution itself. So you can see that this, like the, U the U.S. started off by saying, "Oh, we're not going to get involved in China. It's not. We don't. It's been too. We just got out of a major world war. It's not worth it." But as we can see, when the Korean War broke out, that changed, and so. Um, we, you can note that 
of Truman's press conference in, conferences in January 1950. So when the Korean War breaks out in 19, June 1950, um, it changes basically everything. So because North Korea, we all know North Korea was supported by China and the Soviet Union and invades South Korea, which, had, which was supported by the US. <laughs> Korea had been divided into two countries after World War II. And so when General MacArthur visits Taiwan in August 1950, he, General MacArthur, right there, um, he, he actually uh, played a significant role in um, the, specific, the Pacific theater, um, and he visited Taiwan to judge its uh, defensive capabilities. And so he actually worked uh, with the pres with the then with the president then of the KMT and the people and the Republic of China, um, Chiang Kai Shek, um, and he, he had greatly admired um, Kai Shek for his efforts to resist communism. And so we all, um, the dominant theory and the team theory play a lot in here because the defensive bases in Taiwan would be necessary in order to contain communism inside uh, uh, China because they were afraid of uh, the East Asia falling to communism itself. And so, yeah, we, uh, as mentioned, the Cold War, there's a lot of those, uh, those fought through proxy countries. So, say, you know, Soviet Union fought through China, uh, U.S. fought through Taiwan. And so, this is Kim Kai-shek, he's the People's Republic of China and leader of the KMT. He succeeded Sun Yat-sen um, um, as the president, and he um, unified China during the Second Sino Japanese War. And he was very well regarded in the international community for that. But, um, he, uh, he, when he was ousted, he sort of lost face because um, he was he was he was the better organized. Uh, the KMT had organizations in China working towards like trying to nationalize, like create national feeling in China, but um, that didn't work out as well as he planned. And so um, Sun Yat-sen actually had really had actually had actually good relations with. Communist China, Com um, the Communist Party. The Communist Party operated through uh, party organizations through that, and so which he was unable, which Chiang Kai-shek was unable to maintain. He, was, he always dreamed of taking back the mainland, which would uh, place insignificantly when um, President Eisenhower had the state of the Union in 1955. Um, but as president, he wasn't much better as Mao Zedong, um, despite the dem democratic constitution. He imprisoned his enemies and anyone who opposed them by denouncing them as communists. He wasn't very much like he wasn't very like much like Truman because he was viewed as a um, thief as he took in hundreds of millions of dollars from Ch um, the U.S. in order to resist Trump, com um, the Communist Party. And so his life in, in the end, his legacy was that he united China after the World War period. He helped defeat Japan during World War II. He stopped and he established the groundwork for Taiwan to become the four Asian Tigers, which I will mention later. But he's also remembered as a dictator because he refused to let go of power. He disregarded the constitution, which had a two-term limit, with, and he was re-elected four times, I believe. And he jailed his enemies and opposition without reason and, ref and refused to purge the government of corruption. There was a lot of graft in the, um, the KMT, which is why it was so unpopular in China. Most people were actually happy when it was ousted. And so, because his followers were loyal to him. And so, um, Eisenhower actually plays a pretty significant part. We all know Eisenhower. Uh, um, campaign on a promise to resist, he was strongly anti communist. Um, so, through his various State of the Unions, um, Eisenhower made it very clear how much he opposed communism. He ran, um, he, he sanctioned Chiang Kai shek and Taiwanese attack on China despite the, li the low likelihood of that ever occurring because China's, uh, Taiwan's a small island nation and China's China. And so, during, his time, during this time, um, the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty would be passed, which which passed in 1955, and he prepared for the possibility of a Soviet-supported China attack on Taiwan. It, the treaty refers to mutual defense in case of an attack on either Taiwan or the U.S., but your real-life application leaning towards more U.S. domination in East Asia. And so, basically, this led to closer indicates closer ties between the U.S. and Taiwan, but um, a significant event during the time period was the Sino split um, of, of 1956, where after um, Stalin's death, the president, um, the, the leader of the Soviet Union, denounced uh, Stalinism and his policies, and other factors, and other factors including nuclear capabilities, led Zedong to be upset with Khrushchev, and he decided that the U.S. was not China's greatest, greatest enemy, but the Soviet Union itself, and so. Another significant time period is also the Vietnam War. We learned in during the time period that China was not equal to the Soviet Union. They did not have the same goals. 
which is reflected with the Steiner split. And it sort of revisits the domino theory, because after South Vietnam fell, it proved that, um, the, uh, that East Asia would not fall to communism as had been predicted. And it leads to President Nixon being open to communicating with China, which may seem surprised to most, but he was, he was actually willing to address the possibility of communication itself. And so, finally, we have the Taiwan Relations Act, which is 1979. Um, Taiwan escalated the policy of the three no's. Um, it says, um, while the U.S. was willing to communicate with China, Taiwan refused to do so. Um, the, the policy itself is no official contact, no, no negotiation, no compromises. It was conceived in April 1979 when China tried to re-establish communication between the two countries. But also un unnoticed in this period of time, time period is that other countries were actually shifting diplomatic recognition from China, Taiwan to China. In 1971, the Taiwan lost its seat on the UN, camp, UN Council as the representative of China, which, had kept, uh, which had, it had held as a founding member in 1945. So that's, that's a really big change. My parents lived during this time period, and they just mentioned a lot of fear going on, especially with the Taiwan Relations Act, because they knew, they knew the U.S. was really big and really strong. They know where it was, they know how big it was, but they just knew that it was, it was basically the only thing that was stopping China from retaking back Taiwan, which, yeah, great. Right. So the by 1979, the U.S. was willing to uh, shift official diplomatic recognition to, from China, Taiwan to China, and as per the Sino Mutual <coughs> Treaty, um, Article 10, this treaty shall remain in force indefinitely. Either party may uh, terminate it one, one year after the notice has given to each party. So in 1980, the, the Sino American Mutual Defense Treaty ended. And so there's also, um, also it, or this reflects the One China policy, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. The One China policy basically states that um, it does not state whether or not the People's Republic of China is China, or the Republic of China is China, which sounds really complicated. It's, it's actually really, really, really complicated, because when I was reading about it, I was just like, I don't really know what's going on, but it's OK. Um, so basically, um, it, it also acknowledges that there is one China, but despite the fact there are two nations being claimed to be China, it has manifested itself today, mostly in the international sporting events, when, where Taiwan athletes compete under, in, uh, under the um, country China, China's Taipei, which is controversial in and of itself. So, actually, there was a court case against Carter for uh, signing this act into legislation. It's called Gold v. Goldwater v. Carter. Carter, um, Carter uh, Goldwater was a senator from Arizona who opposed uh, Carter's um, signing of um, the act because he believed that because it, it ended the U.S. Senate, it ended a treaty between two countries. And because treaties have to be ratified in the Senate in order to pass, he believed that um, because he had targeted ended the treaty without consulting the Senate, it was um, unconstitutional, which the Supreme Court argued differently. And so, but, but however, the U.S. is still involved, it's greatly involved in Taiwan post-1979. Quite a fact, recently, President Obama signed, signed, um, signed an agreement where uh, the, the China picked Taiwan paid the U.S. for um, uh, military weapons in order to defend itself. And so, while the U.S. does not diplomatically, diplomatically recognize the Republic of China, there are, are there are efforts to establish in China, Taiwan to establish itself as an independent nation, which is reflected in the fact that in 2016, um, Taiwan re-elected the Democratic Progressive Party um, and its first female president, who is um, strongly who is who is for. Taiwan re-establishing re itself as an independent nation rather than trying to claim the title of the Republic of China. Um, it's actually it's actually really, really interesting. When I went visited Taiwan uh, this past winter, we went to the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial, and because I, I I wasn't very familiar with Taiwanese history, I learned that the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial has been renamed several times in the past as uh, the parties in power. You have the Green Party and the Blue Party. The Green Party is currently in power right now, but the Blue Party is the KMT. And so, it's just like they keep on renaming it because they named it the Memorial Hall for like World War II and all that stuff. And then the Blue Party names it Chiang Kai-shek because it has focuses on his efforts during World War II to defeat the Communist Party, uh, to do, defeat Japan. And so, Questions? Yes, questions. Uh, today, what is your opinion? Do Taiwanese want to be part of the mainland China? I have 
honestly don't think so, despite the fact that China likes to claim that Taiwan is still part, because there's like a real controversial thing between the Taiwan, Taiwanese community and the Chinese community, because Chinese people don't like it when Taiwan claims to be its like own its own like identity, like their own like race, but because um, they believe because because Taiwan had been a colony of China for like 300, 400 years. And so they believe, oh, their their identity isn't the same. But the thing is, it's like China had Taiwan. Taiwan was a colony of Japan for 50 years. Do we are do, is there still the same claim? And it's sort of like my opinion of it is that um, it's sort of just like it's sort of like um, Confucianism. Like Confucianism originated from China. It still plays a role in Korea and um, Japan. But it's not like China is trying to claim that Korea, Korea and Japan are the same. And that's how I feel about that. I can talk to you longer if you want to.